there, I'm Fawn Ellerbrook, and I want to welcome you to another episode of What Matters Most, where we sit around the table for conversations about topics that matter in our everyday lives. Today's episode is the second conversation in our Fruit of the Spirit series. Tabitha Kaplinger sat down with two faith community friends, Chris Routon and Katie Geary, to talk about love. What is it? How do we experience it? What does it look like to walk in it? Really just all the things. Part of this conversation also talks about some of their experiences of not being loved well, or moments where they didn't love so well themselves, even in the church and amongst Christian community. I appreciate their candor and insight into how we can do better as followers of Christ when it comes to showing the generous love we've received. So sit back, grab a pen and paper if you're the note-taking type, and enjoy this conversation on what matters most. All right, so thanks so much for joining us. We are continuing our conversation on the fruit of the Spirit this um, episode. Yeah, we'll go with episode. That feels like the right word, guys. And I have with me again, you may remember from our first episode where we introduced the topic, I have Chris. Hello. And we have a new voice with us today. So why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, my name is Katie Geary and I work with the youth. I'm madly in love with teenagers. I guess that's okay to say. Um, You know, like I'm a person that loves the older age group and do not put me in the nursery. So you will find me, yeah, (laughs) you'll find me with the older kids. Um, And I guess a fun fact about me that you might not know is that I love to do aerial for exercise. So like the hoop or the silks, hauling myself up there and holding myself in the air. I think for people who have no idea really what this is, you have to give a little more description. It's like Cirque du Soleil. There it is. Okay. There it is. Yeah. (laughs) But for normal people, I guess. I, I like it. Thanks. I'm always impressed by that because my version of exercise is how many times I have to get up and walk to the kitchen and reheat my coffee (laughs) on a regular day. But anyway, we won't talk about my lack of nutrition. That's a good version of exercise, though. I could deal with that. Yeah. I mean, I got to stand up. I got to spec down this like squats. I can, it's also abs. I mean, yeah, like, come on. There's a lot that happens. And I had to do it a lot because my coffee continually gets cold. But anyway, so we've been talking about the fruit of the spirit. Uh, we just started talking about it and that the fruit or the result of the Spirit's transforming work in our lives mm-hmm. as we abide in Him. That's what our discussion was last time. And so what we're going to do here on out is we're just going to work our way through the list of fruit that Paul gives us in Galatians 5 and just take them one at a time. So today, um, we're just going to go straight in order. So if you are in Galatians 5, chapter uh, chapter 5, I, I just said that, verse 22, <laughs> that's where Paul gives us this list. And the first one on the list is love. So today we're talking about love, guys. Love, true love. Sweet love. Sweet love, love is love. Pure. Love is love. All the, I just all had the to love. say that. I had to do that. We're in love with love. <laughs> all the things. It's we a, do love love. We do. I feel like we have a culture that very much loves love and the idea of love. And so I think it's important with each one of the fruit of the spirit, with that being said, that we take a moment before we really dive into the conversation and look at the language of this word. Let's define some, um, define the word because in the Greek, which is what the New Testament is written in, so that's what Paul wrote the book of Galatians, and there are actually several words for love. You know, in English, we just say like, I love you, I love Jesus, I love tacos. And we, we kind of, there's nuance in the context, but we don't really, I think a lot of times go in deep on that. But in the Greek, there were several words. So I'm just going to list off some words for love that they have, and then we'll get to the word for love in Galatians 5. So they have eros, which is a romantic, passionate love where like erotic comes from. Phileo, um, which is an affectionate love, kind of like a brotherly love. Storge, which is a familiar or a familial love. Mania is an obsessive love. Um, Ludus, I'm going to assume I'm pronouncing this right. If you're a Greek <laughs> scholar, just let it go if I'm saying it wrong. Um, playful love. Pragma is an enduring love. Um, I'm not even going to pronounce the last <laughs> one. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not even going to. I'm not even, I'll, if you really want to know, you could Google it. But it is Greek and it means a self-love. And so, again, because we know this word love has a lot of nuance. So when Paul writes 
that one of the fruit of the Spirit is love. When he lists that under the fruit in Galatians 5, he's using the Greek word agape, which is the word for love most often often associated with God. And agape is selfless, unconditional, a perfect love. And I think we need to understand that because it matters for defining what that result of the Holy Spirit looks like in our life. So why, so I wanna hear from you, why does the definition matter? Why does our, how we define that word love matter? Chris? Well, hey, <laughs> you wanna start? Since you threw me out there. I, I, th- I <laughs> Do think, it. I think it matters a lot. Um, and, and here's why. I think culturally we do a terrible job loving and it, it, it hurts my soul. Mm-hmm. Um, I see it happen every day. And I think that's the one thing that I can say um, is a distinctive of our faith is when we come into Christ and we receive that love in our heart and, and we allow the Holy Spirit to really begin to transform us, how we love and how we give love then begins to look so much different because then we're loving like our savior. We're loving through the lens of grace. And it's really sad to me, people outside of faith who don't know how to love through the lens of grace. And, and that's where you see it get really messed up. And so I think it's important um, from a Christ follower perspective to be able to not only know how to identify it and to define it, but learn how to walk it out right. Right. Yeah. Um, For me, I think growing up, I didn't grow up in the church. And so I saw Eros love or romantic, erotic love as like, that's what love was. Mm -hmm. That's what the movies showed me. That's really kind of what my my family um, of origin taught me. So then when I was a teen, you know, without Jesus, what I went looking for was romantic love. And in all the wrong ways, of course, you know, premature sexual relationships. And at the time, like it would feel like love because someone was choosing me at that moment. Um, But then, of course, right after it was over, it Mm -hmm. felt like trash. And that's definitely not how the father loves us. So that, that love that I was looking for in that encounter is exactly what I received from Jesus now, that I don't have to go looking anywhere else. It is a perfect heavenly love. And when I know like how loved I am by him, there, there's no other source. There's no other yeah. place I need to go, which is also part of the reasons why I love working with teenagers, because I think that they get very confused, um, just like I did. Actually, this, this is rampant in our culture. It's not yeah. just teens. People get very confused about what love's, love looks like, and it is it is sacrificial. It is a laying down of our lives. And it's not something that we can do apart from Holy Spirit. It just gets twisted. Exactly. And I think for those outside of our faith who are not believers, who are not Jesus followers, they, you know, they're going to have a specific understanding of love that's based on culture. And Mm -hmm. so like you said, it, it becomes all about romance. Our culture loves romance. It loves a good love story. I mean, I still love a good love story. I, I I'll do just... too. Like, and there's nothing wrong with that, yeah. but but love is so much deeper. That's just mm-hmm. one facet of love. But if that's the only love that we know, then it's also the only love we know how to reach out for. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. when it's not fulfilling because it's not really Because love, it can't be. It can't be, then you know, we're left a little empty. And then I think as Jesus followers, if we don't have a correct definition of love, as far as biblical love, what the fruit of the spirit love looks like, what God's love looks like, then we are not showing that love. And we have a perception of one another that I think is unfair. I just see like in the past couple years, the number of Christians who I have seen talk about like love your neighbor as though it is weakness, as Mm. though I have seen so many people who are believers make comments on social media or even in some pastors and sermons about how loving others is a form of weakness. Mm. And it kind of blew me away. Like the first time I heard someone say that and they're like, well, you know, that's not what I'm like, what? That That, doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make I'm like, what Bible are you (laughs) reading? And I actually had someone call out, like, specifically, love your neighbor as being not what we should be doing. And I'm like, I don't, 
I don't know what Jesus you're serving, but that's very opposite. But I think for even a lot, they see, well, you know, yeah, the Bible says we're supposed to love others, but, and they add all these caveats to it. Like if, but if we love them too much, then they're going to keep sinning. Or Um, if we, you know what I'm saying? Like it becomes weakness in that way that love is weak to love others is not like, it's not enough maybe is a better way to put it. And I think that comes from a misunderstanding of what biblical love actually looks like. Well, I don't think there's a but after biblical, you know, with biblical, when you said, you know, love them, but yeah, it's like, what is that? What is that even about? You either love or you don't. Exactly. And when we understand biblical love, I think we get it because if you view love as only romantic Mm -hmm. or you view love as affectionate, that phileo or familial love as something then it it isn't enough. And so it feels less than, it feels like we're not doing enough. But when we understand agape, mm-hmm. then I think that changes things because it, it brings the depth of God's love. Cause like, yeah, there is no but. And Jesus was really clear when he said, you know, what's the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Right. In fact, the entire Old Testament, for the Bible scholars out there who really care, the entire Old Testament law in Leviticus can all be summed up in love God and love your neighbor. Mm-hmm. All of it, it all falls under one of those umbrellas. So when Jesus made that statement in the gospels, he was actually just being like, this sums it all up. What sums it up? Love but it's not a cheap love. It's not just affection for Mm -hmm. someone, though that can certainly be part of it, but agape is so much more than goosebumps or affection or even emotion. Right. And I think that's a really important thing to understand because if, if the fruit of the spirit are the results of the spirit working in our life, then to know, we talked about this last time, being able to assess, okay, where, where am I lining up with God and where am I not? If you don't have a correct view of what his love looks like, then how do you know if what you're offering the world is agape or some cheaper version? Right. I think too, when you're talking about the cheap love, I think that people are focused on the outcome. If you're worried about loving too much because then someone might X, Y, or Z, and just remembering that that's not our job, that's not even our problem actually that we are called to love and the outcome is up to the Lord. Yeah. The results are not my category. mm -hmm. The other thing that I find that is really prevalent is that the love outside of uh, the Christ love um, is conditional and has limitations. Mm -hmm. And that's not how Jesus loves us, period, the end. There is no condition, there's no limitation, even at the worst of our worst of our worst. He doesn't turn his back on us. Um, But people outside of faith, and and sadly sometimes even people inside of faith, have done that, You know, who really don't have a grasp. It's like they love you until all of a sudden, oh, I just found out, Tabitha, you're not who I thought you were. You weren't this thing that I thought you believed in, and, and you go in this direction, and and then there's always the, how could you? Yeah. I mean, I, I've literally yeah, yeah. had people say that to me. How could you be a human? When when they find out that I have a particular point of view on a subject that might be passionate to them, and my point of view is completely contrary uh, to what theirs is, or, or let's just even go a little further. Um, I do my best to make my points of view line up with scripture. And that's not always popular either. Yeah. And so then I'll have someone like, well, I, how, you know, how how could you call yourself a Christian and feel that way? That's not really loving people. And I'm like, wait a minute, what? Yeah. You know. And then the next thing you know, you're ghosted, and it's like, well, I thought I thought there was this whole love thing going on, because there's that. conditions outside mm-hmm. of when when you learn to love like Christ, and it it's a challenge. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to do. I mean, I'm not sitting here saying that I'm the most you know, perfect, you know, love human you know, that yeah. God created. Because love, to, to want to walk in love and want to walk in that Holy Spirit um, culture, if you will, it takes work, it takes effort, and it's not always easy. Oh, it's, I think it's the opposite of easy. And that might be part of the problem is we want love to be easy. And so the moment it gets hard, we want to make excuses to not do it. 
maybe. Mm, yeah, I, my personality type though, I'm like, ooh, it's hard. This is where I'm digging in. Like, this is <laughs> yeah. where the love of Jesus can really shine. And I think when you're talking about like being ghosted because of your beliefs or people not fully understanding what true agape, selfless love is, that's really where grace comes in, right? Like where we can look to Jesus to see how Jesus would love and recognize that people are really doing their best most of the time. Yeah. And even when they're super judgy of us and ghosting us and cutting us out of their lives, um, it, it's been my experience that they really believe that they are loving the way that Jesus would love. I'm speaking about Christians, of mm-hmm. course, not not secular yeah. people. But in that mistakenness, right? Because I, I don't believe that I believe reconciliation is always um, on the father's heart. But in that, like recognizing that it's a a revelation that they need Mm -hmm. to have and praying and remaining soft. That's the thing. We've got to remain soft when people don't love us well. Yeah. And it comes from abiding in Jesus. We can't can't understand how to offer his kind of love if we are not living with it as a source for Mm -hmm. ourselves. If we're not, staying in that place of nearness to him. And I think I was reading today, Felicia Masonheimer posted something. Your favorite. I do, I love her. (laughs) Um, And she posted something about abiding because we talked about the the way that this, we get this fruit in our life and it's cultivated and nurtured in our life is by choosing to abide in Jesus. And she kind of made this statement that was, so often we abide or we think of abiding as I need to do these spiritual things so that I feel like I'm like checking off all the boxes. Almost like it's it's kind of, it becomes really workspace instead of like, I just get to be close to Jesus. Mm-hmm. I get to live in that space of his love. I like am, am privileged to live under his love and grace. And so when we view it as kind of check boxes that I have to do to look holy or to perceive myself as holy, we're missing that love component and it makes it really hard to offer that to other people. Well, you is it okay that I Oh, go wherever right, you cool. want. <laughs> and for those of you listening, we have notes that uh, <laughs> someone has put together beautifully. Is that Tabitha, great. So you have here that it, it talks about love being in action and it, yeah. it, that's sort of on point with what you're talking about. Um, when we have the check boxes and we're doing things because it makes us feel good, yeah. well, then that is a love that's not an, a love in action because if love is in action and it's really that Christ kind of love, it's really about what we give out to other people. It, it's yeah. not, you know, if if I'm doing things, if I'm doing things for you, but the only reason I'm doing it is like, well, I got to, you know, I got to check off my do good thing today for tab, and and now I feel good about myself. I don't know. I that kind yeah. of that kind of cheapens it. I I would I would hope that I could wake up today and just say I want to do something for Brian and Tabitha because they need that done, and and that's what I'm called to do as a human being who's yeah. experienced the love of Jesus. I want to give that to them. And Not it's because, op- yeah. oh, I need to feel good about myself. Well, because it's often real agape is often very inconvenient and very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. It's not selfless if it's not sacrificial, you know, mm-hmm. in giving of ourselves. And sometimes I think we feel like love should feel good. Mm-hmm. But that agape is not an emotion. It's less a feeling we feel and it's mm-hmm. more a choice that we're making. It's a lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. Right. Of, of It's a lifestyle of behavior, of obedience, of living the character of Jesus towards others. Mm-hmm. Even when I don't feel like it, even when it doesn't feel good. And But I think that's where we have to, as Jesus followers who have the Holy Spirit in us and are abiding, like we have to let him transform our perspective and transform our hearts to get to that place. And it does take practice. This isn't about, we're just going to flip a switch and get it right the first time. It takes because we're human, like we're all working it out. But I think having that perception, we have just these definitions of love 
and what we think it ought to feel like if I'm doing it right. right. And I just think the reality is so much different than that. Well, I can give you a recent example as if yesterday of being on the receiving end of what I feel true agape love is like, and we talk about love in action. Um, we've recently moved and um, I would say it was overwhelming to say the least. I mean, when you've lived somewhere for 10 years, uh, you accumulate a lot of things. And so there was just some setbacks last week that uh, just kind of threw us off and threw us off our schedule. So here we are on our holiday. Uh, I've still got some things that need to be done um, because of setbacks and other things. So on a holiday, I had uh, friends, a couple of my friends that I just, you know, we're friends forever. It doesn't matter. I and I haven't really seen them in about a year. Well, here they are at seven in the morning meeting me at my house. And I know that they had better things to do. And um, then follow up uh, two hours later, another friend comes over on their day off. And I'm like, you need to go home. You, you need to go rest. You've had a really busy week. And they're like, no, I'm, I'm here. Let's get this yeah. done. You need help. And so it's like, I know they would have rather not spent their <laughs> holiday helping me out. But it was just like uh, the three people that were there, there was such determination that, no, we're, we're going to do this. Mm. We've got other things going on, but that, that can wait. This is really important right now. And I'm, I'm sure that if they would have you know, scheduled you know, a month ago, what do I want to do on my holiday? It's like, yeah, not go help out Chris. <laughs> you know, I, They all work hard. They all had the day off, but there they were, super early in the morning doing something that wasn't fun at all. <laughs> And to me, it's like I was on the receiving end of agape love. It wasn't convenient. It wasn't fun. Um, and it wasn't just because I'm such a great person. But <laughs> I, no way. Uh, but nonetheless, I felt like I was the recipient of that. And so it is It is something that you put into action and you decide, I'm going to do this. This doesn't feel good. It's inconvenient. But this is something that's needed. And so I'm going to put that into action. So I think that is an example of what it, it could look like. For sure. Yeah, I think too, I have an example of love in action that isn't necessarily like an act of service, but a way to do relationship together. So we had a, a Friendsgiving and some of you guys know John Lester and he's actually one of my besties. And he walked in, gave my youngest son a giant hug and I flipped out. And why would I flip out, you you would ask maybe? And, and that's because my son doesn't like physical touch. And he doesn't like hugs and John comes in and like invades his space. And I, I yelled in front of everyone, John, stop. And then like proceeded to kind of flip out a little bit. So you can imagine how the rest of the evening was. It was really fun around my house because we were just hanging out. Right. Uh, no, that interaction, me like losing it on John because of the situation um, caused the whole evening to feel a little awkward and tense, even though I went over and like apologized immediately once I had regained control of myself. But the next day I called him and cause we had to have this conversation about it cause it was still awkward. And um, that's to me, an example of agape love. Mm -hmm. Like when I can mess up, show my humanity, not act perfectly, but then walk it out with someone who knows how to do conflict. And he could tell me how my speaking to him that way in front of everyone made him feel and allow me to feel sorrow for it and then go as far as to like pray for me and kind of dig in a little bit deeper as to why I had that reaction, mm -hmm. which the reason guys is because I actually haven't hugged Sam in like 10 years out of respect for what I know mm -hmm. his boundaries are. So when I saw John like doing the cry of my heart, <laughs> basically to hug my youngest, um, it really, it, it just set me off. But of course that wasn't something that I processed um, mm -hmm. consciously. So anyway, the fact that, because what John could have done is been like, I'm never going to be in that situation again with her. I'm mm -hmm. not going to hang out with her anymore. I'm not going to share my heart with her anymore. He's part of my small group. So we, we get into all of life together. Um, but instead he remains soft and now our relationship is is better than ever. So to me, that's another act of agape. Is it yeah. fun? No. Was it comfortable? No. But on the other side, yeah. we both knew Jesus better. Because it's that grace, like Chris yeah. said earlier, through the lens of grace. Mm -hmm. And I think humility. And when we go to scripture, and again, because I think we get these perceptions of love from culture, even not necessarily realizing how much has invaded us mm -hmm. um, from culture and and shifted and you know created the experience or the perception that we have. But when we go to scripture, 
the things that I think we see in that culture would define as love, not even just romantic love, but that affectionate love, what culture would define as love. And even as believers, sometimes what we think love ought to look like. When you look at God's word, it is vastly different (laughs) and it's super uncomfortable and it's super humbling. And um, just to throw out a couple areas, you know, we all know First Corinthians 13, right? They read mm-hmm. it at all the weddings. Mm-hmm. Spoiler alert, it's Red not about mine. marriage. That's um, right. <laughs> it's fine to read it at your wedding, mm-hmm. no judgment, but it's not about marriage. It's mm-hmm. about leadership. It's about influence. Yeah. It's about um, how we live within community. And if we look at that list of what love looks like, right? That it um, keeps no record of wrong. Mm-hmm. It does not envy. It does not boast. It does not dishonor others. Like you can read through that. Nothing in that list is super feel good. Right. Like none of it. None of it is convenient. And then actually, one of my favorite sections of scripture that talks about love is from Romans 12, the end of chapter 12. And it says, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking, keep your spiritual fervor, um, be patient in affliction, joyful in hope. Like that, if you read from uh, Romans 12, verse nine through the end of the chapter, all of that is about love, what God's agape love looks like in action. And again, none of it is feel good. None of it is, oh, I'm going to get goosebumps and butterflies and I'm going to walk away from well, this. Well, there's that point about joy in there. Yeah. I yeah, would that, say that, that, that does is, feel good. That's a, that's a little nice, the, the joy part. <laughs> yeah. Paul yeah. likes, he throws in a little bit every now and again to keep you, <laughs> keep you reading. And there's a consistent word in that scripture and Corinthians, it starts up, love is patient. Mm-hmm. I mean, we can just stop right there. Right. Yeah. And talk about, I mean, it, that, that's hard, being For patient. Sure. You know, being patient sometimes... Um, in a relationship uh, that is not great, yeah, and you go for years and years and years, but I'm still going to choose to love. Um, being uh, patient in situations on a job or employment where you're dealing with difficult people, you know, the easy thing to do would be to check out and and say see you never. But you know, yeah. it's well, like do we view because we don't view patience as love, right? Like, but being patient with someone is an act of love toward them. And even just, I was looking again at Romans 12, the very end of that, it it talks about loving your enemies. Do not repay evil, anyone mm-hmm. evil for evil, mm-hmm. being careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it be possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Again, mm-hmm. let's point out the words everyone because mm-hmm. agape doesn't gatekeep. Agape mm-hmm. doesn't get to choose who is worthy. And, but then he goes, you know, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Um, and like that's our act of vengeance toward our enemy. Paul is saying is love. Mm-hmm. Like you have someone that you disagree with and how our culture is so us versus them and so enjoys being divisive, the mm-hmm. drama of it all. But love is saying, hey, that person on the other side of the aisle, that person on the other side of the issue, on the other side of the disagreement, who maybe not consciously you would call your enemy because we all love Jesus too much to say that. But in our hearts, we would say, that's my enemy. It's it's me versus them. And he's saying, you know how you, you, know how you get them? Love them. Mm-hmm. Feed them when they're hungry. Mm-hmm. Give them something to drink when they're thirsty. And it's like, it's practical. It's not just say it. It's do something, that action. And I think that that's, the love that makes a difference when Jesus said, you know, they will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. He's not talking about how often we can, you know, just maybe get together and have fun and say nice things. Right. He's talking about this humility and vulnerability that the way we do life together founded and rooted in a deep love for one another when we disagree, Mm -hmm. when we mess up, that that's, you know, that's Jesus working. That's how they're going to see Jesus. And if we want culture to see Jesus, we can't do it without that kind of love. All right. So I'm going to throw a wrench in that just for a little bit and spin Go it around. It. What do we do? Um, I guess that would be the right way to say it. When we experience Christ's love sometimes outside of church culture more than we experience inside church culture because I have been there. Yeah. And that's what really just gets in my heart in yeah. a 
bad way. Can you tell me you know, what do you mean? Like an example? I don't think, I mean, an exa- I mean, I'll just, I don't want to give specifics, but I would say I have found many times that inside the church, I'm not loved well mm. in church community. I've, I do have an, a, a, a season of my life where, where the love that I found that I need, that God, I believe, divinely sent to me came from an outside church community mm-hmm. of friends in my life that helped me walk through a situation, a season far better than the church. Because at that time in church, I was the recipient of a lot of uh, opinions Mm -hmm. and judgment Mm -hmm. and negativity and finger pointing and shaming. Right. Mm -hmm. Those are the things during that season that I received from the church. Mm -hmm. Outside of the church, I received affirmation, acceptance, building up my self-esteem, telling me, no, Chris, you've got this. You can do that. And I remember saying to my wife, I like just through through tears because I was heartbroken because that was one moment where I felt like the church let me down. And my mm, career yeah. has been in mm. church. I love serving the church right. more than anything in my life. But that was a situation where it was like my leadership community just was like, I'm like, do we read the same Bible? Mm-hmm. Because I'm not feeling it. And how is it, you know, but God works in mysterious ways. He can use anybody, you know, so I I want to make sure to, you know, affirm Mm -hmm. that there are times outside of church community, you can still find Christ-like love. Um, They don't know it, but God knows it. And God knows who Mm -hmm. you need in your life, when you need in your life. But, but I think that's something that is prevalent in um, our, our times where people are not experiencing what we're talking about in church and yeah. they're leaving, they're bailing. Yeah, yeah. I th- for me, I think a lot of that has to do with what you had said about acceptance mm-hmm. um, because I feel like we as the church forget that love comes first and that we have to, someone has to know how loved, valued, and seen that they are. They mm-hmm. have to experience that agape love in a one-on-one relationship before we can begin to address those deeper issues. At least this is the way that I have seen Mm-hmm. the experience that you're talking about played out in my life and in culture, especially with teenagers. So if I may just go there, the um, gender confusion that is going on with a lot of our young people right now, it's because they're finding that acceptance in that community. And not mm-hmm. only that acceptance, but that welcome and that call to, hey, come be with us. We're not going to judge you. I mean, you have to change everything about yourself, but the call is we're going to love you for who you are and we can be your family. And Mm -hmm. that we've got it so backwards in the church. We're the ones that are the family. We are the ones that need to be calling people and drawing people in. Jesus did not turn away from us when we were our most wretched Mm -hmm. and that the church needs to learn how to love when we are wretched. And and for, oh, go ahead. I was just saying what you said too, is that the love, has to come first. We lead with love. And I think sometimes in the church world, because it is so heartbreaking and so sad to know that there are so many people that grew up in church and were so wounded by a community that should have loved them and been healing for them that they walk away from that community or they walk away from Jesus. And I think part of it is we, because we misunderstand love, Mm -hmm. we don't lead with the right kind of love. And so in a situation where, and sometimes it's just because humans are humans and imperfect, but even I've seen too, it's, and, and within church culture, we, we put a priority on like calling out sin. We put a priority on speaking truth, which we should, but to not to the detriment of love. Right. Like it is the truth in love. Mm -hmm. And can I also point out, it's the truth of the gospel of Jesus before any other truth that you want to point out. Like you have to lead someone to Jesus before then you, before you can help um, teach them how to live like Jesus. But we get so, well, we have to speak truth. We have to speak truth. We have to call out sin. And that's so fear-based, which is fear is the mm-hmm. opposite of love. Yeah. And it's so fear-based because we're so afraid. If I don't say the thing or if I love them while helping correct, mm-hmm. while helping admonish, then what if they don't get it? What if they keep on and and like you said earlier, like it's not our job to be the Holy Spirit. Amen. That nope. is like he didn't ask us to do that. I did not die on the cross to be anyone's Messiah. That's right. And so 
I just need to love people. And does that mean speaking truth? Yes. Does that mean calling out sin? Yes. But here's the difference. When I lead with love, I speak those hard things from a place that says, I want better for you, not I need to feel righteous, I need to be right, Mm -hmm. or I'm afraid that no one else will say it and the Holy Spirit isn't big enough. He totally needs my help. (laughs) And so like, and I think that's where the church gets it wrong sometimes. We're so quick to wanna call out the bad from a place of fear, which Mm -hmm. is just the opposite of the heart of God. Um, He doesn't motivate us with fear. He motivates us with power and love and a sound mind. But also like we, we, we do it for our own selfishness. It's more about me and my image. It's more about me being right. It's my own fear. Or uncomfortable. My own, yeah, or my own mm-hmm. pride or my own unwillingness to be uncomfortable. So I don't lead with love in those areas. Um, and so nothing good really ever happens because either I'm calling out all the stuff and leaving a bunch of people wounded and broken mm-hmm. behind me or I'm not calling out anything and I'm not leading people to obedience. But Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. So like his love language is obedience and you can't lead people deeper into that without doing it from a place of grace and love. And and I think that's where we end up in situations where outside the church community can feel more loving. We can feel like we're getting Mm -hmm. that unconditional love um, and maybe it's, and certainly there are seasons where God uses that and he uses yeah. people outside because the Holy Spirit can use whoever he wants, however That's he right. wants, whenever he wants, um, even if they don't yet fully know him. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're just going to throw a wrench in that for those mm-hmm. of you that think yeah. that he can't, he can, totally. um, he can use whoever he wants in our lives. And, and also sometimes it, it's not like Katie on your end, it's a false love. It's a false acceptance. It's a false sense of belonging, um, and mm-hmm. so we have to, we, it, it, again, it goes back to, if we don't understand what real love is, that's when we get it wrong and we cause more hurt yeah. than help. I think you had said too, something about, well, calling it out in others, calling sin out in others. And the fact of the matter is, is that if they're a Christian, they already know. Like yeah. they already know. We have yeah. to trust Jesus to do what he says he's gonna do. At least that's been in my the case in my life. Nobody has ever come to me and said, Hey, Katie, this area is sinful, and I've been totally shocked. Yeah, <laughs> like that's just no. What? Yeah, <laughs> that is just not how. That's not how our God is. He loves us too much, and He lets us know. Mm-hmm. So, can we just walk alongside people yeah. and love them as they move from where they are to where God wants them to be? I mean, that is yeah. my goal. Yeah, a couple of thoughts I have. Uh, when I was new here at Faith Community Church. Josh and I went through a season where we were kind of vetting one another out. Mm. And one of the things that really spoke to my heart was when um, in my list of questions, I said, I called out, uh, you know, so what if uh, this kind of person walked through the doors of the church and was sitting in the seats, you know, how would you respond to them? What would you say? And I remember his look was like, yeah, um, nothing. (laughs) And I was like, Okay, he's like, I'm going to get up and teach truth and live truth and love people really well. And then he began to tell me stories of his, uh, you know, uh, experience that the Holy Spirit transforms people. He's like, I didn't have to say a thing. I just did my job as the pastor. I loved everybody who walked through the doors of the church. And I watched the Holy Spirit work in people's lives just from being in an environment of, of truth and environment of love. And he goes, I watched transformation happen. He goes, I never said a thing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right, I'll check that box. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? And but that I think that's uh it's a that's why I'm here. You know, yeah. my I've I I chose this church and I believe God brought me to it just because it is an environment where it does feel good. No, we're not perfect, but and I think that's why I felt the need to, you know, kind of call out um that we're not just here saying that inside the Christ community, we're just perfect and we do love right all the time. And oh, it's bad sure outside because it's that's not the <laughs> yeah. truth. I think sometimes yeah. it's worse inside this community than it is outside this community. And yeah. that's why I think we need to really be aware constantly of, of this topic here, the fruit of the spirit. And we need to, we need to continually just 
foster that and learn how to navigate that in our lives so we can do it well and do it the way Jesus did. Do it the way, you know, our pastor quickly taught me. Yeah, I don't say nothing. I just yeah. speak mm-hmm. truth, love like people, we, and let the Holy Spirit do like his we work. Just let, yeah, let the Holy Spirit do his job. Does the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. use us sometimes and, and want us to speak things? And it's like, hey, go talk to that person about this. Or, hey, you're in this conversation. Sure, the Holy Spirit does that. But I think like in, we well, should be tapped into it yeah. too, to know. And to know and to discern, hey, mm-hmm. and a lot of times I find like, trust me, I can be sassy as the next gal and I have opinions on everything. <laughs> and a lot of times I'll feel like, hey, I really want to say this to someone. Usually for me, if I really want to say it, it is probably not the Holy Spirit and I need to <laughs> not say it. But I always am like, I'm, I ask the question, mm-hmm. hey, Holy Spirit, is this you wanting me to have this conversation or is it my pride? Is it my fear? And if it's you, like, why? Why do I feel the need to say this? And mm-hmm. we check those things with the Holy Spirit because he's not mm-hmm. going to lead us wrong. And I think sometimes maybe we jump the gun mm-hmm. within church community in, in those things because I, I, let's give people the benefit of the doubt. They want to lead people to Jesus. Yeah. They want to be mm-hmm. Christ-like. They want to be doing the right thing. And fear and pride can get the best of all mm-hmm. of us and we don't realize it. And it goes back to, again, what we talked about last week, the importance of examining ourselves, self-assessment, examining my own motives so that I know, am I being motivated by love in the way mm-hmm. I'm treating this person? Or am I being motivated by something that's actually gonna do more harm if I'm not careful? But let's ask the question because you brought up, you know, people who get hurt within the church, within mm-hmm. church community. What would you say to someone? How would you help someone who is going through and experiencing that kind of hurt. And they would say, I mean, I see it on my TikTok all the time. And they would say, I don't feel loved. I don't see the love of God. What would maybe you say to them? What would you encourage them? Or how would you encourage them? Well, I, what I would do is I, I want to know their story. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think it's important, especially people in those situations, they need to feel heard because oftentimes they've never been allowed to tell their story. They've never been allowed to Mm -hmm. say, this is what I'm feeling. This is what was done to me. Sometimes it's just that's cut off. So I want to make sure, number one, that someone feels heard. So if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't felt heard, call us. We will listen to you. But Mm -hmm. I think I want to hear the story. Tell me how you got to where you are. And then I want someone to educate me. So tell me what I can do to be better. How can I not repeat what was done to you? Mm -hmm. Because for me, I'm not going to worry about any other leader or person in the church. I just want to, I need to learn because I am a leader in the church. Um, And so I just, I take those things as education. And I I find that people are really appreciative when they know that you want to learn, you know, because maybe I've done some of those things. Yeah. You know, so I, I want to make sure that I'm aware so I don't repeat bad habits or or I'm just <coughs> cognitive of like, oh, these people have these kinds of feelings and I might have been insensitive at some point in my life or maybe even right now just out of ignorance. So I don't want to be ignorant. I want to learn. I want to learn what your experience was. So that's, I guess that it would be that those questions to those people. And then I've said this before, um, on behalf of church and <laughs> church leaders, I'm sorry, and I hope that you'll give me and give our leadership a chance. Help us do it right. Help us do it better, and maybe we can get into a dialogue and and walk with you and help you get to a place where you feel more comfortable coming back into this community because love is a big deal, and we want to do it right. So that would be my response. Yeah, um, I would totally agree with the I'm sorry and letting people know that no matter what you have heard about Christians or what you have experienced with Christians, we don't always get it right. Just like we said, we are just human people that are trying to follow God the best way that we can. And I think sometimes we get put on a pedestal of, well, you should have known better because you're a Christian. But what does that mean? It just means that I was a messed up wreck that needed a savior. So I'm sorry if I'm not perfectly transformed yet, and capable of hurting you. So I guess I would ask for like forgiveness, first of all, that we messed up, but also the, the same grace, yeah. you know, f- because Jesus has forgiven us so much that I'm assuming if you were a part of a church body and you were hurt, that you have received Jesus and that you do have Holy Spirit in you. And remember, remember 
that we have been forgiven much, and so yeah. we are to forgive much. That's so good. do not let your church hurt hold you back from receiving the love of God through imperfect people. I think that's so good because I think ultimately we point people back to Jesus who is the only one who does it perfectly. Right. And I think too, within the church community, we have to lose the chip on our shoulder that we get sometimes yeah. that makes us want to get defensive right? and makes us want to debate a thing and or even feel like, well, people are just trying to figure out ways to put Christians down. Are there certain people that do that? Sure. Are there certain Christians that make it really easy for them to do that? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, I kind of feel like we've yep. given some of those people great material. <laughs> I also feel like there's a lot of people who are not believers, who are not Jesus followers, who we get the chip on our shoulder that we're expected to be perfect and I feel like most people who are not Jesus followers actually do not have that expectation. Mm -hmm. I think the expectation is that we're trying. Mm -hmm. right. I think the expectation is that if we say we believe in Jesus and his word and his character and his values, that we're actually making the attempt there you go. to live it. Right. And they actually probably have more grace mm -hmm. for our mistakes than we think they do. But because the moment someone asks a question, the moment someone mentions hurt, the pride and fear mm. creep in, mm. we get defensive and we double down on their hurt and we make it worse rather than going, hey, you know what? Like we're not perfect. Right. And maybe there's, there we need to try harder. And so I love just asking the question and being, hey, what did you need? What did you need? in that yeah. moment. I've had the opportunity to talk with several um, people. We have several um, people in our church who are victims of abuse, victims of domestic violence. And just having that conversation, because several of them within our church that I know personally that are my friends, the churches that they went to in the midst of that abuse and when they brought it to light, didn't necessarily handle it well. And I don't say that with any kind of judgment because we're all imperfect. Maybe they didn't know how to handle it better. Right. Um, but I love having those conversations because I, I've asked, what did you need your youth pastor to do in that moment or your youth leader? What did you need leadership to do in that moment? Why? So we can learn so that the next person, we can uh, proceed from a place of love that offers healing and safety and help um, rather than just making the same mistake. And even for those people, hey, I can't go back and undo what was done to you within mm -hmm. church community, but I can work really hard to offer a place here that lifts you up yes. on a foundation of love that is going to bring healing yes. for you. And I think that that's super important. And it does, I feel like there's always a need when we talk about a lot of this stuff, about, especially about love, which you, know, you end up talking about forgiveness and how we treat either, others is kind of having the disclaimer. Because we can ask, how do we, how can we love those we find unlovable? And so I'm gonna let you guys think about that for a moment while I offer a little disclaimer here, mm -hmm. um, because that can be really hard as a believer to love, how, you know, how can we approach that? But the disclaimer um, for those who you would say the unlovable person in your life is abusive, that you can love them from a distance, mm -hmm. that um, you need to be safe. And so when we talk about loving someone who's unlovable, that doesn't, mean that there are no boundaries sometimes and that that can um, honor God. And so I always just like to put that in there because I don't want anyone to ever hear us talk about something. And we can assume, oh, they know I'm not talking about them in their situation. Um, they actually may not know that. <laughs> and so if as we talk about loving others and loving others well and giving sacrificially and unconditionally, that by no means um, is us telling you to stay in a situation where you are abused or violated or unsafe. That is not the love of God or right. I think uh, anything that honors God. And so we want you to be able to find safety first. So now to our question, um, as we kind of wrap up here, um, well, we'll have a couple, you know, how do we love those who are unlovable? Me or you? <laughs> Go Whoever. Um, I guess I would ask what's unlovable mm -hmm. because I was for sure unlovable. I was before Jesus a, a mess of a person, defensive, posturing, pretending, uh, trying to, I would do whatever was best for me. 
And I'm sorry if that didn't work out so great for you. It was all about me. So I would have put myself in the unlovable uh, territory depending on, you know, who you were and how I treated you. Then you would probably think that I was unlovable. So uh, I think that just remembering, hey, that was my story. That was who I was. That was who I, I was before I met Jesus and knowing that I can reach out to someone else with grace and mercy that maybe I didn't receive when I was acting in a really unlovable way. Because the, the truth of the matter is that we're all created in God's image and there's no one that is beyond his reach and his grasp. And if it starts with a, a smile from me, because my daughter says I walk around with a pleasant mm. face on for everyone around mm. me. I just have like this little smile on my face because, you know, when you encounter people at the grocery store and they've got like these big old grumpy faces or they're, you can tell they're mad, what do you do? You steer clear, right? So if I can at least make my face look, look presentable and pleasant for people around me, well, maybe that will be enough to engage in a conversation with someone that is receiving very little love in their lives. That's good. I, I think it's a... It's a question that can't be answered completely in a few moments because I think there's different degrees of unlovable. Yeah. You know, there's you know unlovable things that we experience on a on a daily basis. People with bad attitudes, people that we just maybe you know genuinely don't like. Um, that you know, and I would say, well, I don't have to have you in my circle. I don't have to like you or your behavior or, mm-hmm. or who you are. But you know, if if I saw you on you know the side of the street, you know, I'd offer a hand. Because, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to see you harmed. I might not like you. But then there's the degree of, you know, when you think of unlovable, you think of someone who is in prison for murder. Yeah. And, um, you know, certainly God loves those people in spite of what they've done. You know, and I would think, uh, and I don't know anyone uh, in prison for murder, but if I did, you know, how, how would I, you know, how would I think about that? You know, it's like, Um, there are consequences for our actions, but I think loving someone fundamentally can even just come down to, well, that person is deserving of Jesus. And I hope that in their final moments on earth, they find Jesus and ask forgiveness for their sins. Sometimes that is the best we've got, but I think even that mindset is loving someone who's unlovable. Loving mm-hmm. someone who's unlovable doesn't mean that you have to invite them in to live in your house <laughs> or yeah, right. you know become your best friend. Sometimes the act of love is just having a mindset of, I hope you find Jesus in your final moments and find eternal peace. I will say though, I do have a neighbor, we're building, I won't say anybody's names, but I do have a neighbor up there who is, I mean, by reputation, a menace to the entire neighborhood. There's multiple restraining orders on him from multiple people, right? But like, he's my pet project. And as soon as I move in, it's Mm -hmm. gonna be like cookies every week and trying to love this man who is despised um, by the rest of the community just because I can from a place of overflow and I'm gonna do it. We'll see, he might not ever come around, but maybe after years of getting cookies on a weekly basis and a smile, and some friendly talk, maybe he'll want to yeah. know yeah. what's different about me. Because I then, think we, no, go ahead. I would say another question I would ask myself too with with that kind of love in those circumstances, um, is it worth let, letting that um, hate, if you will, and mm-hmm. all those bad feelings have real estate in my brain? That's good. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Right. And sometimes it... Forgiveness and you know walking away from something and and just wishing someone well, although hard, sometimes that's the most freeing thing we can do for ourselves. Yeah, because it it just is draining to walk around with hate in your heart and unforgiveness. Um, and so I think you know learning to love the unlovable in your life, whatever that looks like, could actually be a really good thing for you in the in the yeah. long run if you can get there. So That's I would good. I would encourage everybody to try to do that because there is a reward for us for showing that kind of love. I think it boils down to how we view ourselves and remembering right. like you said Katie remembering 
that we all were unlovable. Mm -hmm. Like none of us are deserving of the love of God, yet he gives it freely anyway. And then choosing to perceive others and see others through his eyes. How mm-hmm. does how does he view this person? Right. And again, maybe that there are people that we're going to set boundaries with. We still need to be wise. Why? Because we are still humans mm-hmm. right. who who are imperfect and and struggle with our flesh and things. So there are situations where we need to have boundaries, where we need to use wisdom in how how far we're going to go from that place of love. But I can choose even the people, like you said, that I need to set a boundary with, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to necessarily let super close into my life. I can choose to perceive them and view them through God's love. That's right. Um, And so I think that, again, it's having that perception that God's love is so penetrating who we are as we receive more and more of it from him that we are able to offer more and more of it. So as we close up, like we said, one of the the key to the fruit of the spirit being cultivated and developed and nurtured in our lives is abiding in him, which we talked about. Mm -hmm. You can go to John chapter 15 for that. And so I wanted to just kind of leave you with a thought, a final thought, and then kind of a practical take home, homework, homework for the month here with love. And one is remembering that Jesus said the greatest commandments are to love God with all that you are and to love your neighbor as yourself. And remembering you cannot do one without the other. If we want to be a people who show love, who know how to love our neighbor, who's our neighbor? Everyone. You can't escape it. It's actually everyone. If you want to do that, then we have to be in a place where we are tapped into the source of God's love, that we understand his love for us, the depth and the width of it, how unconditional and selfless his love is. And the more we abide in just nearness to him, the more we understand his love for us and are able to offer it. So kind of your homework for this month is to abide in his love because that's the starting point. That's the source, that's the foundation. And so maybe I don't know where you are, if you're listening, I don't know where you are with Jesus and his love, you can go back. Maybe your definitions of love need to be shifted a little bit, your perceptions of love, all of those things that we talked about, but maybe start with asking him to reveal his love to you in all its depth and all its selflessness, um, to just wrap you in his love Um, look to the cross for a picture of God's love for you. That's how much he loved you. Mm -hmm. That's how much he was willing to sacrifice. That's how far he was willing to go for you and really receive that. Um, The more we're able to receive that and focus on that picture of his love for us when we are wholly unlovable, even the best of us are wholly unlovable in comparison to the holiness and perfection of and grace of Jesus, then we can take that next step of really being able to love others well. So thank you guys so much for joining. And we will be back next time with our next Fruit of the Spirit. It will be joy. That is on the list. Well, that's it for today, friends. What a powerful conversation about the core message of the gospel, love. I think Tabitha's homework is a perfect place to start, whether you are new to a relationship with Christ or you've been following him your whole life. There really is never a bad time to check in and reset yourself around abiding in him. So over the next few weeks, take some time to invite God into your everyday life. Just like we talked about in the first episode of the series about abiding in Christ, what would it look like to be mindful of him as you prepare dinner or do the laundry? Maybe for you, a first step could be taking a few minutes to practice gratitude for those good things, whether they're big or small. Maybe it's actually getting intentional about reading the Bible on a daily basis, even just focusing on a verse or two. Maybe it's asking a friend to come alongside you in an area of weakness or pain to help point you back to Jesus in the midst of it. Wherever you find yourself as you listen today, whatever your story looks like, I hope you know that you're not alone and you are not forgotten. You are loved deeply and wholly. If you enjoyed this episode, take a moment to subscribe wherever you're listening and share it on social media. We hope to see you back here soon for the next episode as we continue to discover what matters most. Mm -hmm.